Women Taking the Lead, episode 243. I think that oftentimes in our lives, we just, I will veer from, from somebody who might be take a little bit more time to understand. And sometimes if you just take that extra couple of minutes, it can create the greatest connection, you know, that you've had, um, in a long time. If you, if you just go outside of what is normally would be seen as your comfort zone. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Have you grabbed your copy of my best-selling book, Accomplished? How to Go from Dreaming to Doing? Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash accomplished to access the secrets to achievement and success. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Elizabeth Ross Holmstrom, who is the founder and president of Break Together. She founded Break Together to improve health and work in office and tech environments. With 20 years of health and wellness design experience, most recently as vice president with the National Bank and 26,000 employees, she's witnessed the power of mindfulness. We've spent decades creating new ways to connect 24-7, leading to significant increases in stress-related illnesses. Her proven methods help people work better in 2 to 10 minutes a day, unplugged. When she isn't practicing, she may be mountain biking on the nearest wooded trail and singing along the way. Elizabeth, this is one of the reasons why I like you so much, because you (laughs) have that as the last line of your bio, which says a lot about you. But tell us more. Tell us about you and your own humble beginnings. Oh, they're quite humble. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Really, for um, I was I was just thinking when you even look at the question or hear the question, you, you think back and, you know, for me, I really, I listened to all of that. And I have to say, there's a feeling of pride in there because when I started, um, I actually had to leave home early for a variety of reasons and had to leave high school. And so when I started out, I was actually a receptionist and, and then a secretary. And I did that kind of work for a long time. And when I moved to Maine, I ended up being the secretary for this a president and a vice president of a real estate company and a commercial real estate company. And a few months into that job, I actually got a warning from the president. <laughs> he said that, you know, Elizabeth, you know, our customers really like you and we, we love the work that you're doing as a receptionist, but we really need a secretary and you can't type. And so I, um, they offered me the opportunity to go back to school. And so I did. And he said, you know, once we, we get you through school and then we find another secretary, we would like to offer you a role in sales and marketing. And that really launched me into, you know, a, just feeling really excited about someone seeing something in me that I hadn't seen. And then more importantly, finding something that truly was part of, you know, my heart. And I ended up moving into health and wellness with my sales and marketing background. And I love working with employees and wellness programs and employee benefits. So I did that for 20 years, both at a local level here in Maine and then nationally. And most, most, my most recent role, I was responsible for 26,000 employees. And I remember walking through the door, moving from this account relationship and sales role into actually being responsible for benefits for this large company. And it was really fun to think that I was finally going to be able to to use all the things that I'd listened to and heard about and practiced for 20 years and, and be able to to be in a position to make the decisions and, and really help shape a team. And, and that's really what led me to where I am today is just working with different, extremely talented people and, and people who believed in me, even when I maybe didn't believe in myself yet. And then hopefully changing over to a place where now it, 
it's both ways. People believe in me and then I hopefully believe in others and, and help them along. And tell us a little bit of the work that you're doing with Break Together, because I, I totally see the need for more mm-hmm. marketing in the health and wellness field. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's it's a it's an industry that makes a lot of money, but not for all the good reasons. Right. The quick fixes, you know, the gloss overs, they're making a lot of money. But the true the things that truly make health and wellness a transformational experience that needs more marketing. And that's the side that you're on. That's exactly right. So I have been involved with wellness and an employee health program. So building advocacy models for employees, helping them when they are at their, their most challenging places in life. So disease management, like nurses and teams that you can pick up the phone and say, I've got this going on. And they really help you through this really challenging thing that is our health system. And then through that work, I also was exposed to wellness programs over the past 10 years. And when we started out, you know, it really wasn't a thing to go and work out at the gym during the, during the day or to go on walking meetings. And now a lot of us are walking around with Fitbits on our arms and and really counting our steps and and we weren't even really thinking about that and now it's part of most people's programs and when I was managing this budget um, for my last role one of the things that I noticed as much as we were making progress helping people manage diseases and chronic diseases and helping people with activities to stay moving stress keeps going up. And we weren't, at least I wasn't investing a lot of money at that point in things that managed stress. And what I was hearing and what what has been published nationwide and, and globally is that people are stressed because the workloads keep growing. And so when I began to look into that, what I learned about was mindfulness. And mindfulness is something that you really can't pick up a a magazine lately or a ink or fortune magazine, et cetera, without someone speaking to the value of bringing mindfulness into the workplace. And so I started a couple of years ago testing models where I was, and it was amazing. People went from not ever even taking a lunch to occasionally meeting together and having lunch, you know, unplugged in the cafeteria, our, our absent, Um, unplanned absences went down as a result of us connecting on a more frequent level with one another. We did walking meetings. And so that was really what helped me see that we can practice these very simple things and make a huge difference in our, the lives of the people that we're working with by just seeing them and noticing the stress that they're under and then connecting with them as humans and teaching them how to better manage these stressful times and workloads that we're working in. And and I think it just gets more challenging all the time because of devices and all the ways we're expected to connect. We haven't spent a lot of time teaching people how to disconnect. And that's really what keeps me you know, so excited and, and, and doing this work every single day. It's fantastic. I love the work that you're doing and you're jazzed <laughs> about it. And we did our, our first meeting together was a walk around back cove over the summer. Yes. It was a beautiful day. And we got so much accomplished in that meeting. Like we were just chatting the whole time and I walked away with to do's, I, you know, following up <laughs> with different people. So it was as productive, if not more productive, I think, than sitting down uh, for a cup of coffee, which I had there is nothing wrong with that. I enjoy a good right. cup of coffee, but like, especially when the weather's nice, you're meeting somebody for the first time, what better way than to be moving while you're doing it. And Elizabeth, so I true. wanted to, to start it, start you off at the low point, I guess, is, is, <laughs> is where I'm just going to bluntly bring you to, you know, now that we've talked about all this amazing work that you're right. doing and how you've come so far from being a secretary to a mm. vice president to now taking the, your mission and the work that you're doing <laughs> out into the, the larger world, I'd like you to bring us back to a time in your life when you were playing small. And that refers back to the Marianne Williamson quote I play at the end of every episode. Share with us the story of your playing small moment and the lessons you've learned. About probably several years ago, um, 
now, maybe maybe eight or nine years ago, I was moved. Um, some some of the leaders that I worked with had seen work that I was doing here on this on a local level, and said, you know, we've got this new program that's based in New York, and and you're going to be working with this very um, high profile um, private equity firm, and they gave me the opportunity and promoted me to manage this new program, and. This program was leading 70 different work groups to provide a specialized customer service and an advocacy program and a specialized product um, for the sergeant insurance company for a, a client. And so I was responsible for the client relationship, which was something I was pretty used to all along, as well as helping describe that that product um, internally to the organization. And, and the reason I go into that detail is that what happened is, is that to try and keep everybody on the same page, I had to have this monthly call with all of these different players to talk to them about what was going on with this new product and how we were doing with implementation and, and things like that. And every time we were on this call, the person, my direct counterpart at this large private equity firm would be on the call. And this person was um, a, a really challenging um, individual sometimes. And one day, this person um, ended up just berating some of the people on my team about something that hadn't even been substantiated. So we're on a call with 70 people. I've got my little account manager hat on. Like I've got a, you know, I'm responsible for this relationship. I'm responsible for inside the company. And I truly felt myself sinking into the ground. Like as she started yelling at some, some folks that were on my team and I just, so we had to end the call. I had to be professional and just lead her away from the discussion that she was having to say, you know, I think we need to, to stop this conversation on this group call and I'm going to talk to you, you know, afterward. And I literally just left my, my office and I had to take a walk around the block and I was just, I felt like my head was going to pop. And I just, I was, I was I was so afraid to confront her because I had to tell her that that's not okay, like to bring something like that up. And I was so worried that she was going to say, you know, hey, we're the client. We want her off the account because of this. And what happened is I confronted and I called and and I said, you know, this is we need to respect one another. And we are doing, you know, this work on this side and you're doing that work on that side. And and we have a really strong partnership that we built together. And it's really challenging. You know, we have to have this sort of level of operating agreement together so that we don't strip each other down. And from then on, it turned out to be the best working relationship I ever had because I stood up and then I became, you know, the, the true manager of that entire program, which was what I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine if you remained the person who was cringing on the other end of the phone <sighs> with your head about to pop, having mm. to go for a while, like imagine, because sometimes this is what happens is other people go through that. But they can't make they can't have the conversation that they want to have, right? They yes. they placate, they you know diminish you know the, mm -hmm. what they wanted to say. They water it down. They make light of it. That sort of thing. What had you get the courage to say what you needed to say to her? I think sometimes it's just about how many times you've done that. And I think for me, I had not, I'd had instincts in the past and let them go. And, and I knew that this was a, a moment where I needed to be working at the level that I wanted to be working at and not, not playing that lower role, like not saying, okay, this is the client and everything the client does is, is gold and you're just going to do whatever it is that they need. And that was never what was actually taught to me. That was just some weird thing that I had in my head that I, you know, I had to do whatever it took to please the client when in actuality, two human beings coming to each other respectfully creates a better client relationship. And so I knew it somewhere. I just hadn't had the courage yeah. before. And sometimes that's what it takes. Like when we think about like as bad as what we need to do is the mm. alternative feels far worse. Yeah. At that point it was abs. I just could not do it again. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do it. 
And what a great outcome. Like you had to do it, right? You had to buck up. You got on the call. Yes. You said what you needed to say. And it was fine. I think I wish we could all have more experiences like that where we we buck up, we have the conversation. And more often than not, it's fine. As long as you can right. remain respectful of the other yes. person while you talk about what needs to happen, chances are they're going to stay with you in the conversation yes. and see the benefits of changing behavior as well. And that walk was everything. Taking that walk and getting my thoughts together before I just hung up the call and immediately called her back. Yeah. That was another divine intervention that I just knew that somehow I needed. And it was great because I was able to, you know, sometimes we want to respond in the heat of the moment. And and it was really nice to unplug and 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 really gather thoughts before I had that conversation. Mm-hmm. Take a break. Yes. <laughs> I love it. And Elizabeth, what I want everyone to get is there is no one way to lead. So I ask all my guests this question. I want there to be a plethora of answers on this one. Mm-hmm. How would you describe your leadership style? I really enjoy looking for strengths. In, and I've been through, I don't know if you've heard of the Gallup Strength Finders mm-hmm. um, program. Yes. Um, I've always intuitively felt like it's it makes more sense to work on the things that you are good at and then collaborate with others on the things that you aren't as good at. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that is something that I've, I've really tried to use for a long time in my leadership style. And that is finding what, finding out what people on my team or the people that I'm working with are good at, and then using that, like building that map of the things that we need. And when we need something done, um, we don't just go to a, a, a position title to get it done. We go to the person who has a strength in that thing. And it also helps you build your teams. So when I had vacancies in a, in a team and I was looking for, for somebody new, it really helped me to define a, a, a gap that we, that we needed to fill in terms of, of experience and of skill sets. And, and I feel like that's a really, that's been valuable as well. Yeah. And I can imagine when you're on the lookout for what people's Mm. strengths are and you point them out to people, they feel appreciated and seen. Completely. I think that people are, they're waiting to be seen. And I'm reading a book right now, the, um, the power it's, I think the power of moments. It's the, it's the newest book by, um, Dan and Chip Heath. And, and part of this piece that they're, that I'm reading right now in the book is about the power of moments and and about the power of people wanting to be seen. And the thing that they remember the most, even five and 10 years later, people remember just somebody singling them out for something they witnessed that they were doing that was right. And having the courage to just, or the the wherewithal to Mm -hmm. say it in that moment. I love it. Zola is the wedding company that will do anything for love. Zola is reinventing the wedding planning and registry experience to make the happiest moment in our couple's lives even happier. It's free, easy to use, and fun. You can personalize your registry with photos and notes about why you're coveting certain gifts. And their group gifting feature lets multiple guests contribute to big ticket gifts. The top-rated Zola app for iPhone, iPad, and Apple Watch allows couples to manage their registries on the go. You also get price matching and free shipping every day. Join over 300,000 couples who have used Zola. To sign up with Zola and receive a $50 credit towards your own registry, go to Zola.com forward slash lead. That's Zola, Z as in zebra, O-L-A dot com forward slash lead to get your $50 credit towards your own registry. And Elizabeth, what is one thing you're working on right now that you're really excited about and want to share with us? Well, I am working on updating my website and I'm very excited about that. Um, I've been doing this work now um, for a year and like anything, you have one vision when you go into it and then when you start collaborating and doing it with others and, and seeing what works and what doesn't, 
now I have, you know, a clearer product and a, a clearer um, path to describe. And so I'm very excited about um, putting that into words so that people can can better understand um, the kind of things that we're doing and, and offering. And it feels it feels wonderful to just to see it all come together and know that it was a village that created it. Mm, and we're both crossing our fingers that it is live yes. for everyone to look at the day this episode goes live yes. so they can see <laughs> your schmancy new website. <laughs> That's exciting. It is fun. And on the flip side of things, Elizabeth, what would you say is the biggest leadership or business challenge you're faced with right now? And we'll see if there's an opportunity for coaching. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> I, my biggest challenge is, is prioritizing my to-do list. You know, I, I've got, especially when you're kind of somewhat of a solopreneur, I have a lot of consultants that I work with, but just really making myself at the end of the day and at the very beginning of the day, look at the things that I absolutely need to focus on first and do them and not get sucked into, you know, other things coming at me as I first start, you know, logging into the world. Okay. So tell me about your routine. So it sounds to me like you do have a bit of a process where you're making a list and looking at it. Tell me Mm. about that. Well, at night, um, before I end the day, I'm really trying to be more intentional and not have my devices on at the end of the day at home. Um, or at least, you know, really limit that to just maybe a half an hour here or, or there. Um, and so I really try to close out my day by looking at the next day, um, you know, maybe at five, six o'clock so that I, so I have a sense of what is on the day and I kind of write out what I think. And then in the morning, because sometimes it takes me all night to think about it, I wake up in the morning and I, and again, the intention is to kind of look at that list and is there anything I missed or I thought of overnight and then set my path for the day. And what I find that happens with that best intention is that I will wake up and I will see something that somebody, you know, sent me via email and are asking about or a volunteer project that I'm working on that, you know, really could be done in a week, but I, I know it's a quick hit and I'll go after it, but it wastes an hour. Like that kind of thing is what I'm doing. Okay. So what is appealing to you with these other things that are, you know, hitting your inbox or, you know, your, your list that takes your attention away from the things that you know are high priority <laughs> for you and your business. I think it's the fact that it can be done fast, mm-hmm. right? Like somewhat fast. Like it's not a two hour project. It's a 15 minute project or it's, you know, some of what I'm doing isn't nobody else is seeing it for a while. And so this is something I know I can do and send it back to somebody and they say, Oh, thank you. So for you, there is you know, pleasure in the quick hit. Yes. And in the, you know, there's an actual person out there I'm doing something for. Mm -hmm. And that makes you feel accomplished. And I hear a little bit of fulfillment in that Mm -hmm. as well. Where do the negative feelings come in? When I get to noontime and I'm, you know, a half an hour in on the project that I was supposed to have done by noontime. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. And now Mm -hmm. you're looking back at how you spent your morning and it wasn't good. Okay. So what are some of the strategies that you've already started attempting to prevent this from happening again? Um, Well, actually taking the very first thing and loading it up, like having it be the first thing that pops up on my laptop. Mm -hmm. So if it's a document of some sort, then like today I was, I'm working on a presentation for a workshop that I'm doing Wednesday. And so I made sure that that PowerPoint, um, which is just kind of where I start, was up. And so when I first opened, I had to, to look at that. Okay. So instead of your email being open or your phone being the first thing you're looking at, you're looking at the thing that is the top priority on your to-do list. Yes. And that worked for you. Today, it sort of worked. Okay. <laughs> I got I got a half an hour or an hour into it, and then you know a phone call came in and and with another thing. So it's just it's a it's a constant juggle for me. Okay, so it sounds like the the ability for these distractions to reach your awareness is part mm. of the problem. Yes. So I shut my ringer off. Okay. So. <laughs> 
That's great. So this is progression. And and everyone listening, I really want you to get this. Like sometimes there isn't a quick solution to what we're facing because we don't realize all the variables that are at play causing the problem. So you have to, you know, come up with a strategy. You put it into play. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. So but you realize what didn't work. And so you tweak the plan and then you tweak the plan and then you tweak the plan. It sounds like this plan has been tweaked a couple of times and you're getting closer and closer. It is. I I actually, you know, I did work on that the the very first thing and I I hardly have any. um, I just have a couple of rereads to do, which I needed to do anyway. So it's it's definitely working. It's it's about consistency at this point. Right. So now you just have to. And do you have I should ask, have accountability partners been working for you overall or how would you say they've been working for you? Yes, I have an ex. I work in a co working space, Mm -hmm. um, Cloudport here in Portland, and I have an excellent accountability partner. We get together every two weeks and we talk about like the big, because you can get working on your client work. And then you, we all have our personal lives that we need to work on. And oftentimes for a business owner, moving your own business ahead or doing things that, that will help your business in the future um, or, and your clients, therefore, in the future, because you're looking ahead at what's coming, um, sometimes that gets pushed off because it isn't immediate. And so I sit down with, with this accountability partner for one hour each two weeks and a half an hour we spend on my stuff and a half an hour on his stuff. And it's been really powerful because you know you can't push anything out longer than two weeks because you have to have it done in order to report in. Right. I love it. It's been great. Yes. So the two-week report in will definitely work for this. But one recommendation I would make or an invitation I will Mm. extend to you is that when you're looking at your list at the end of the day, I want you to document if you were able to follow your plan. So your plan (gasps) being set the priorities, have the first and largest priority up on your computer, ready to go first thing. And that email and phone and all of that is shut off until you get your priorities done. I love that. All right. I'll do that. And then at the end of two weeks, you can report into your accountability partner and let them know how many times it, you know, you followed the plan and it worked and how many times you didn't. Thank you. I will actually write that out and send a note so that I can't you can't that, that, that I was supposed to do it. Right. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Okay, Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell <laughs> us, what is one practice you have that helps to make you a better leader? Being compassionate and and really trying to listen to, you know, where the, the other folks in the room that I might be working with or, or coaching or or just, um, speaking with and, and trying to really understand, you know, where they're truly coming from so that I can, can be a better, better at serving them. What advice would you give your younger self? Trust your intuitions. Share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. Well, this is from Tom Robbins, and it's something that I I keep coming back to is that there's no such thing as a weird human being. It's just that some people might require more understanding than others. And why does that quote have meaning for you? I think that Oftentimes in our lives, we just, I will veer from, from somebody who might be, take a little bit more time to understand. And sometimes if you just take that extra couple of minutes, it can create the greatest connection, you know, that you've had, um, in a long time. If you, if you just go outside of what is normally would be seen as your comfort zone. Love it. And lastly, Elizabeth, what is the best way for this community to connect with you and see what you're up to? Well, you can always email me at elizabeth at breaktogether.net. I have a, the website, which is breaktogether.net, which is up now, but there'll be um, improvements coming. And then I also do have a podcast called The Art of the Break. And I um, am not as frequent as Jody with her podcast, but I have made it a practice to, as I learn about new people in the space of mindfulness and resiliency and working better together, I um, have been interviewing them. And there's just really some 
incredible people out there doing this work. Mm -hmm. And I've listened to some of your episodes. They are fantastic. We can all learn a little bit more about mindfulness. Yeah, (laughs) every minute. (laughs) Every minute. And for those of you listening, you can find all the links and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com. Just put Elizabeth's name in the search bar and her show notes page will come right up. And Mm. Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. Jody, thank you. I'm just so blessed that you're in our community and I really appreciate you having me on your show. All right. If you have found yourself spinning your wheels and not getting results, it's likely because you've not cultivated the mindset and level of awareness that will take you there. My book, Accomplished, How to Go from Dreaming to Doing, is a simple step-by-step system that gives you the foundation and the structure to take a goal and make it happen. Go to womentakingthelead.com forward slash accomplish to get your copy so you can start easily achieving the results you want to have. Thank you all for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. And to strengthen you on your own leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson, so here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me, and here's to your success.